Bill, uh, you could comment on a worldwide perspective as the CEO of Medtronic. You obviously have a, both a U.S. and an OUS perspective. And again, as a patient-centric uh, uh, conference that we're having this morning, I wonder if you could uh, comment on where you think we're going and what impact that is going to have on U.S. patients. Well, thank you, Bill. Um, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Bill Hawkins, the chairman and CEO of Medtronic. And I also serve as the head of the Technology and Regulatory Committee for AdvaMed, which is one of the larger trade industry uh, uh, groups um, for our medical device industry. So I have a pretty unique perch for which you know, I interact um, on behalf of device companies with the FDA. And so I've um, been quite involved in a lot of discussions with the FDA of recently. Let me, let me start first, uh, just to a little commercial about this industry I was sharing with the group before. I've been in the medical device world for 33 years and uh, could not be more proud to be a part you know, of what I believe is a unique American success story. This industry, by almost any measure, you know, is um, remarkable in terms of the innovation that we bring forth to advance lives. Uh, looking at it just from an economic perspective, the number of jobs, you know, 500,000 plus jobs, the fact that we generate a favorable balance of trade in a time when trade deficit is becoming an increasing global issue or, or national issue, I should say. So first of all, I mean, this is an industry that we do want to keep, we want to encourage, and we want to, to build. There is no question that right now we are in sort of unprecedented times with a number of forces that are at risk of reshaping you know, this industry. One of those you know, is the regulatory environment that we operate in. Let me take a step back, though, for I know many of you know about the FDA, but uh, I started my career in 1976, which is the same time when the FDA took jurisdiction, you know, over medical devices. And when the FDA was first formed, I mean, it had really two overarching sort of goals. One was to protect public health, and two was to promote public health promote public health by ensuring innovation reaches patients. And we'll talk a little bit about how this, uh, perhaps, their overall objectives have gotten a bit out of balance. But I also want to talk about what I think we need to do to help the FDA to get things back in balance. Because I'm going to make the argument that we do need a very strong FDA. And I would submit right now one of the challenges that we have, this may be a bit provocative, is that we don't have the strongest FDA and as a consequence, we're seeing some of the things that you've heard from Dr. Stack and you will hear from other people. But just as a quick reminder for those of you in terms of what the FDA does, I mean, they basically are charged for working with companies to approve, to ensure that devices that go onto the market you know, are safe and effective. And there's a process called the pre-market approval process, and there's really two means, the 510K, which is for devices where there's a predicate device, and then there's a PMA for devices which there's not a predicate device. And uh, the, on the 510K, the FDA reviews about three to 4,000 products per year, and that's clearly going down. On the PMA, if you look back over the last, say, 10 years, they have approved, on average, about 40 PMAs per year until the last two years. And that's been dropped in half, 16 to 17. The other goal of the FDA is on post-market surveillance. So they're responsible for working with companies to ensure that when devices are in the market, that we have systems to, as early as possible to detect if there's any issue, that we can then address that and, again, to prevent and to protect public health. The third uh, area is in compliance. And while we don't, we, we're hearing a lot of talk about the you know, the environment and getting new products approved uh, for larger companies like Medtronic, I mean, one of the other challenges we're having with the FDA is this increased enforcement environment. You know, the, the fact that we are a highly regulated industry, the FDA comes in on a regular basis and inspects companies and either gives you a clean bill of health or issues a 483 or perhaps a warning letter um, and could be even, you know, you know, escalated from there to a consent degree or whatever else. Now, again, I will tell you in my 33 years, um, I can only remember one other time when we had a really tough time with the FDA, and that was in 93, 94. Mm -hmm. 
But you know, since then, things have, I mean, I think got worked out pretty well. There was a good collaboration with the FDA, and then the last couple of years, it has been a very, very challenging time. We're seeing longer approval times, and I just mentioned some data on PMAs, the fact that we only approved 16 to 17 the last two years versus, on average, 40. If you look at, uh, in terms of, it's taking at between, um, it takes almost 20% longer now to kind of get you know, products through the FDA. And <clears throat> about 56% of the requests to start clinical research are approved in the first round. And what happens then, if we don't get approved, you gotta go back, and then you gotta go back, and it's uh, it just, again, all part of delaying the time it gets new products to the marketplace. One of the other things that we've observed, uh, being a large company with lots of products in the markets, is just this increased enforcement environment. And there are many more warning letters that are being issued to companies. And it's taking much, much longer to get warning letters lifted. Now, when you get a warning letter, you can't ship new products uh, that are manufactured in that facility that's underneath the warning letter. So if you have a new product that's ready to go to the marketplace, and it's manufactured in a facility where there's a warning letter, then you know, technically you can't ship that product. And that's one of the reasons that some people are saying, I'm going to go outside the US because it's a less risky environment to be able to continue to provide products to global customers in the event that something happens here in the US. Now, the other thing I would tell you which concerns me is um, it's just this whole the pendulum in terms of, as it relates to risk, has really shifted. The whole risk versus sort of the benefit sort of ratio. And we're moving to a sort of to a point where the, the expectation is almost zero risk. Mm -hmm. And this is having a profound impact on the consequences of getting products into the marketplace, and recognizing that everything we put into the human body has some risk. But we also know that as we, you know, it, as we evolve the technology, it gets better and better. But you know, we've yet to design anything that is absolutely, you know, unequivocally perfect. And then, as a kind of a result of all this, is just that one of the big challenges that we're having with the FDA is this um, kind of the, 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 the issue around predictability and consistency. If you talk to the small companies, the big companies, and you really boil it down, what they will tell you is the biggest challenge, you know, is just this, you, you just don't know. Who's going to show up at the FDA? You know, what they're kind of, you know, you know, today they may tell you something, and then the next meeting, it's totally different. So there's this whole predictability and this whole consistency. So what are the consequences? Well, you've heard already from Dr. Stack. I mean, companies you know, are moving outside the US. Venture capital is drying up. Um, there is, um, I mean, companies are, are shutting down. I mean, I, uh, we, we see it every day, um, you know, even for, and there's, there's also an unintended consequence. I think that some of what's going on is also kind of creating a bit of fear you know, in sort of even the public's mind you know, and as a result of some of the recalls that happen, which uh, could happen for very, various different reasons. But when you hear and when you see sort of publicly that there's a big recall, it also can, can perhaps uh, intimidate or scare patients from wanting to have a device that may be necessary to extend their life. So let me just conclude by telling you what, what, what should we do. And this will be very provocative, but uh, first of all, I think we've got to get out of this mode of just kind of bashing the FDA. That's not doing us any good. It's just creating you know, confrontation. There's no question that we've got to get in there and meet with the FDA and go and talk to the Dr. Hombergs, who I know was here yesterday, meet with the Dr. Shurins of the world. I'm going to be there next week meeting again with Dr. Shuren. But we've got to go in. We've got to be constructive. We've got to have the data. We have to have the, you know, the information. And we've got, to, we've got to make sure that they understand the, the unintended consequences you know, of some of the actions that are taking place today. As I said earlier, we need a strong FDA. Um, and the reality is the FDA isn't able to attract the kind of resources that it needs to have to, to, for people that can be at the same level as industry. And the FDA doesn't have an incentive to take a lot of risk. And so if they are sort of intimidated by industry or if they don't have the, 
the skills or the knowledge, you know, the best the thing that they're going to do is just say no. So we need to ensure that the FDA is well funded. We need to make sure that they are well resourced. We need to make sure that they have the right skills and capabilities such that they can sort of, sort of interpolate and when you're seeing data and then not just say no, but say yes. So, um, and we need, we need a greater transparency, we need and a greater sense of urgency from the FDA. And so there's a lot of things that we, we need to do to strengthen the overall FDA. And we're about to enter in a very sort of interesting period. At the beginning of this year, we'll, we, the, the user fees for the FDA come up you know, for renegotiation. And uh, I can assure you there's going to be, this, this will be, um, there'll be a lot of different points of view. And uh, you know, we're paying the FDA right now for the work that they do. And, I think we're going to all have to take a step back, and I know it's, it's not going to be popular, but I do think in, uh, at the end of the day, we're going to have to think about how do we help the FDA become a stronger FDA so that it has the resources, that it has the skills, that it has the capabilities to be able to do the job that they need to do and not just say no. Thank you. Thank you.